start until you tell me. Until you tell me, go. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to this last lecture of, of the Invisible School. We will land in with the uh, direct detection in Dermet by Yonit. Uh, remember that after this hour of class, there will be the visit to the dark matter laboratories uh, given by Laura Baudis. So please, uh, uh, you need go ahead. Okay, thanks so much, Luca, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining again. Um, so this is our our fourth um, and final uh, lesson in uh, in this lecture series for the school. And today we're going to be talking about direct detection of dark matter. Now this is a this is a pretty big um, a pretty big topic in general. Um, if you recall, on Wednesday at the end of our third lecture, we went over a whole sorts of um, all sorts of constraints that exist and possible signals of how we could hope to um, to detect dark matter. And we listed a whole bunch of them. And uh, direct detection is certainly one of those um, one of those things that would be on that list. Um, but because it's a very active field of research, that um, I think there's a lot of Really new and interesting directions, um, and a lot of a lot of room for fresh ideas to come uh, to come into the field and to really make an impact. Then I wanted us to sort of dedicate um, dedicate this last uh, this last hour of our course together um, to giving you a little bit of a sense of the types of um, types of materials, types of methods that um, that people have been proposed and hopefully to help you um, gain a good intuition into this. And maybe you're going to be the one who in the future will be able to propose an amazing new um, detector that could, uh, that could win you the Nobel Prize. So, um, so let's, uh, let's get going with this. So um, for direct detection, what, they, what we mean by direct is that um, we hope to be able to detect dark matter interacting with some target that's sitting in a lab. So this is, this is no longer seeing uh, dark matter through its gravitational, um, its gravitational pull or sort of inferring it from observing other particles, but literally um, being uh, from interactions that happen in the sky, but literally be able to detect it interacting with us uh, in a lab. So that's what direct detection is all about. So um, dark matter interacts with a target in the lab. Now, of course, this lab is um, typically sitting deep underground to try to suppress as much uh, as much backgrounds as we can. So this lab is typically deep underground. And uh, I'm excited to hear you guys are going to be able to to take a tour um, of uh, I'm sure such such a, such a lab together with uh, Laura Boutis after um, after this uh, after our lesson. So you know, again, uh, thinking of sort of of time going. You know, time going in this direction. So imagine that I have some dark matter particle. Okay, it's somehow interacting and it just scatters out. It's interacting with some target that's sitting in the lab. Okay. Um, now you'll see sometimes people in the literature, um, you know, one way that you can think of such an interaction happening is, for instance, this is often a diagram that you might see, is to think of sort of a diagram where dark matter interacts through some mediator, some particle, um, with some target that's sitting here in the lab. Okay, so that's um, a type of diagram that you might see. But really what I want you to just keep in mind is, you know, we have some before situation where here's my target. Okay, I'll denote that, let's say, by capital T. Um, dark matter comes in. And then afterwards, you know, something's happening. Dark matter shoots out and something has happened to this target. You know, maybe the target is excited. I'll denote that with a little, a little star. Maybe it's shooting out a photon. Maybe it's shooting out electrons. Maybe it's shooting out phonons. Something is happening. The system is somehow getting excited, and um, we hope to measure the reaction, to measure the response of the system to the fact that an interaction had occurred. And sort of um, historically, uh, you know, guided. If I think of like of the case of the WIMP, so I remind you these uh, two to two annihilations. Then you know, if I think of the process in the early universe that sets the dark matter relative abundance. In that case, it's these two to two annihilations where two dark matter particles annihilate into two. Um, ordinary particles. Um, so this is sort of, this is the regular plot that we discussed in our first lecture today, um, together um, on Monday. Then sort of for a whip case, um, people often sort of draw, di draw arrows um, in different directions on this diagram. So there's the annihilation direction. But if I take the same type of interaction and I look at it now from this, um, from this perspective, then what I have is dark matter scattering off of standard model particles. So this is what we call, this would be sort of the direct detection direction 
And uh, we also have going in this direction, we'd have indirect detection. Okay, so that's sort of um, often in the case of the WIMP, um, you'll hear statements that, um, that you know that there's a relationship um, between the process in the early universe that sets the relic abundance versus the direct detection um, process and the indirect detection process. But as we've seen, uh, we have many different types of mechanisms in the early universe that can uh, set the relic abundance. So there need not be such a tight, um, such a tight relationship between these different, um, between these different cross sections, between these different processes. Nonetheless, the one that we're going to be focusing on um, today is the direct detection. And indeed, as we as we saw in our uh, first couple of lectures, that many of the mechanisms that describe how, that explain how we end up with the amount of dark matter that we have in our universe today often involve some type of interaction with standard model particles. And so we do indeed have great hope that we, will, that we can be able to detect um, dark matter through its interactions with particles that are sitting in the lab. So uh, we definitely have many, many, many experiments that are searching uh, for dark matter in the lab. So we have many experiments searching for dark matter um, uh, in this way, where they're looking for this reaction of the system. Um, and so just to sort of, I'm by no means giving you a laundry list, but just sort of to, to throw a bunch of names that you might have heard of. So we have um, a bunch of xenon experiments. There's xenon 1 ton, there's LUX, there's LZ, which is planned. Um, we have, there's Panda X, there's Crest, um, there is Damic, there is Dark Side, there is uh, CDMS, and the list really goes on. Um, but what I want to, um, um, uh, we're not going to learn what each one of these experiments um, experiment does, um, but here's sort of a typical plot that you'll uh, often see from a direct detection uh, collaboration, or often it's a plot that's summarizing all of the results from all of these collaborations. And what it is is the following plot. So it's going to show us the size of um, currently the constraints that we can place as a function of the dark matter mass on the size of the interaction cross-section between dark matter and particles sitting in the lab. And these are typically um, heavy nuclei, as, uh, as we're going to explain. Um, and so what happens for these uh, sort of for these plots, and it's obviously only covering a certain region, here's sort of the type of constraint. Okay? Each experiment will have its own particular location of where this curve sits. But this is showing you some constraint on the size of the interaction cross-section versus the mass that, um, that the dark matter particle can have. Um, and so, you know, sort of um, the, currently the strongest bounds, whoops, sorry, so sort of the, the bottom line right now um, is sort of that it dips lowest roughly at 10 GeV, and around GeV um, the curve starts to shoot up, um, and you know, these, these things extend to TeV masses um, and beyond, okay? Um, and so uh, I just want to point out um, a couple of features over here. So the first is um, what's happening over here. Um, so all of these different experiments, they all sort of have this, uh, this tail that's going up with, uh, with a similar slope. And this is just because, um, as we're going to see, the rate is proportional to, um, to the number density of particles, of dark matter particles. So this is just constrained by the fact that number density of our non-relativistic particles goes like the mass density over the mass. So this is just entirely being controlled um, by that fact. And what's controlling on the other end over here and making all of these experiments sort of lose sensitivity typically at masses that are around a few GeV, um, is that things are sort of, over here, you care a little bit more about the properties about the target, but in, pre in uh, um, very importantly, this is really affected a lot by the threshold of these experiments. And so let's take a sketch out what, um, what a rate, uh, the rate of events, how many events of a dark matter scattering would you hope to see in some type of, uh, in some type of detector. Um, so the rate, roughly uh, goes the following. So there's um, a piece that cares about how many particles, how many target particles you can, uh, you can hit. So it goes like one over the, the density of the target. Um, there's a part that cares about the dark matter flux that's coming in, right? Because I have to have dark matter come in in order for me to detect it. Um, there's a part that cares about the target properties. I'll call it that way. Okay, a piece that cares about target properties. And um, there's a piece that cares about the interaction cross-section between dark matter and um, the particles that it's interacting with in your detector. Okay, and so um, this first this first uh, point that I made um, over here about uh, about how how the the bounds typically go um, for high masses. This is exactly coming from um, from the fact that you know this dark matter flux. Um, there's dark matter flux. You can kind of think of it as 
how many particles, the, the number density of the particles times their velocity. So this will go like number density of dark matter times its velocity. And as I said, number density is just rho over m. Um, but we also have this velocity over here. So we care about um, the incoming dark matter velocity. And this is typically, um, so, so this uh, dark matter velocity, what really sits here is some integral um, d3v over some velocity dispersion. Okay, so this is a velocity dispersion. So um, we know roughly that uh, we have a dark matter wind that's a border um, with velocity 10 to the minus 3 the speed of light, but it's not coming really at one single velocity. There's some, uh, there's some spread. Okay, so this is the whole, all of the velocity is of order of 10 to the minus 3, but there is some, uh, some spread. And I'll just write out for you um, the, the velocity dispersion that's, um, that's typically used in case, um, in case it's of interest. So um, usually it's called the standard, oops, usually what's used is called the standard halo, halo model, standard halo model. Um, and so, you know, this is some, uh, it's basically a modified Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So um, the dispersion goes like 4 pi um, the velocity over some normalization, um, e to the minus v squared over v naught squared. And then there's a theta function that doesn't allow us to go beyond the escape velocity um, in our uh, local area where just typical values for this v now, which is sort of telling us the spread of this velocity, is 220 kilometers per second, and v escape is ballpark of 500 kilometers per second, okay? And I also remind you that um, our local uh, dark matter um, mass density is 0.3 GV per centimeter cubed. Okay, so this is, um, this is sort of what will, uh, what will typically come in and um, play the role of the dark matter flux. Now, um, what are these experiments uh, typically looking for? Um, they're typically looking for, um, for nuclear recoils, okay? Um, at least the current existing ones. Um, so experiments typically looking for um, nuclear recoils. Okay, now um, the energy that's deposited in a nuclear recoil, so I'll call it energy of nuclear recoil, um, it goes like the momentum transfer of the process squared over twice the target mass. So, you know, if I scroll back, whoop, let me just go back here to our, um, to this, uh, our dark matter scattering process, you know, in this process, there's some energy deposit and some momentum transfer that's happening between the incoming dark matter particle and the target, okay? So um, as a function of, um, of that momentum transfer, the nuclear recoil is just momentum transfer squared over twice the target mass. Now, uh, momentum transfer, you can work out the kinematics. Um, it roughly goes like the mass of the dark matter particle times its velocity. Okay, so let's square that over twice target mass. Um, and you can work out numbers. And for instance, this looks like order EV if the mass of dark matter is 100 MeV. Okay, and there's a square here, and this is where I've taken some target, let's say, at 20 GeV. Okay? Now, and if I want to be able to detect that such a nuclear recoil had happened, then, of course, this, uh, this energy deposit, this nuclear recoil, excuse me, better be above experimental thresholds, which are typically of order a kV. Okay, so this is what, um, what we require in order to be able to observe this nuclear recoil. And so just looking at these numbers, you see that, okay, if I have a dark matter particle that's of order with mass, let's say, 30 GV, then my nuclear recoil energy is going to be 2 kV, and I'm going to have a smiley face in my experiment because I'm in principle sensitive, I'm above threshold, um, and I could in principle detect this, and that's great. Um, but if I have uh, dark matter masses that are you know, smaller than a GV, I can't detect these nuclear recoils, okay? Um, and you can really understand uh, where this is coming from just entirely by thinking of billiard balls. So here's, um, here's the billiard ball picture that I want you to sort of keep in mind. Let's think about billiard balls. Okay? So um, if I'm a heavy particle, a heavy dark matter particle, okay, like a WIMP, which is what these experiments were um, designed, to, uh, designed to detect, then, um, then everything makes actually perfect sense because if I have some big ball... Here's my nuclei that's sitting, uh, that's sitting in the lab. Actually, let me draw that a little bit larger. Sorry, let me, let me do it like this. Here's my big nuclei, heavy ball, sitting in the lab. And I, myself, am a heavy dark matter particle. Then it makes total sense. I can come in, I'll scatter out, and I can give a big enough kick 
and I'll be able to detect this. Okay, so this is um, this is what would happen for a WIMP, and this is why we're happy. It makes total sense. But what happens if I have smaller dark matter, lighter dark matter? Then you can kind of think of this as if it's a um, I'll call it a ping pong ball, ping pong ball that's trying to kick a big bowling ball. Okay, here's my little dark matter, small dark matter, and it's trying to kick this heavy nuclei, and it's just not going to work. Okay, I can't give a big enough punch to kick that heavy nuclei, and so I'm not going to be able to detect light dark matter by looking at heavy targets. Okay, and this is why these experiments are losing sensitivity for light dark matter that drops beneath around a GeV. And so it's great that we have amazing ideas for, um, for searching for the WIMP, but um, what I'd like to focus on is what happens for lighter dark matter. And in particular, as we've seen in, um, in uh, the earlier lectures of this course, there are many mechanisms that indeed predict dark matter that is lighter than, uh, than a GV. In fact, many of the examples that we work through um, for mechanisms are, are fall into this category. And so we want to also have a good way to detect lighter dark matter. And so if we want to detect light dark matter, it's actually smarter to scatter off of something that's lighter. Okay? For instance, electrons. Because then, you know, here's my small, my little dark matter. No problem for it to come and give a kick to, let's say, a light electron. Here's my dark matter, and my electron will be um, will be moved. Okay, so it makes um, it makes much more sense um, to scatter off of something lighter, in particular, electrons. And so from this um, from this basic uh, uh, basic uh, billiard ball picture, um, we've really reached um, what sits sort of at the core. In a way, this is really the basic notion um, that's behind almost all or many of the novel ideas um, that have been proposed in the literature in, our, let's say, over the last uh, decade or so. So this is really the basic, the basic notion that's behind um, the new ideas in the literature. And so uh, moving forward, I think it's actually very useful to look at the following energy guideline energy guideline, okay? So if we want to detect dark matter through a scattering process, then um, the maximum amount of energy that the dark matter could possibly deposit in my system is all of the kinetic energy that it's carrying, okay? Um, so if I'm looking at a scattering process, then um, the maximal amount of deposited energy is the entire kinetic energy. Right? I cannot possibly give more than my kinetic energy in a scattering process. Okay, and this goes roughly like the mass times the velocity squared. And again, I remind you, velocity was of order 10 to the minus 3. So this means that I have 10 to the minus 6 times the mass. Okay? So I'm sort of thinking of, uh, thinking of, of matching what energy I'm sensitive to in my experiment versus what mass does that translate to that I can hope to, um, that I can hope to probe. So here's, let's say, um, let's look at deposited energy, okay, and let's draw up here what happens for um, the mass of dark matter. Then, you know, if I have systems that are sensitive to, whoops, to KV energy deposits, like current thresholds in many of these um, big experiments, then the energy guideline is telling me that I'm sensitive to masses that are a factor of a million larger. So here I'm going to get to GV. And this is indeed exactly what's happening for these existing experiments, okay? But if I want to go down by three orders of magnitude and be sensitive to MEV scale dark matter, then I need systems that are sensitive to an EV of energy deposit. Okay? Very, very different story. And if we want to be very greedy and try to detect dark matter that's all the way down at that warm dark matter limit or the phase space packing limit um, of KV masses, then we need systems that have sensitivity to even tinier energy deposits of order milli electron volt. And we can actually organize um, using sort of using this um, using this as an organizing principle. We can organize all of the ideas um, uh, for new types of detectors that um, that have uh, that that exist in the literature based on the size of their energy deposit that they're sensitive to. Okay. So let me just um, let me just redraw here actually this um, this energy deposit um, line because I'm going to write down two different types of. Uh, so here's my energy deposit. Okay. 
um, and here's my kv ev milli ev um, and i'm separating this over here just because i'm going to have sort of on top um, i'm going to write down a lot of systems whoops um, systems that have interactions that actually use interactions with electrons like we just saw there are also a few systems that use in a smart way interactions with um, with nuclei where what they're really looking at are um, collective excitations that are called phonons okay and we're not going to be um, discussing those in detail but I do want I do want to mention them because they're of course important so um, here here's a sort of a laundry list of um, of different types of uh, uh, different types of materials um, so for the sort of, and here let me draw this line over here also, so okay, I'll, I'll look at um, EV or milli-EV um, types of thresholds. So for the EV and above, um, people have proposed looking at um, using atomic ionization. Um, and this is something that, for instance, you, we have already data from, uh, from a variety of different xenon experiments. Um, we can look at semiconductors. Um, so silicon, germanium, uh, a whole bunch of others. Um, we can think of looking at scintillators. Scintillators. Um, so an example of this would be gallium arsenide, for instance, but of course not, um, not the only one. Um, and we can also look at 2D targets. And an example that we'll talk about will be graphene. And um, going to even smaller, uh, even smaller energy deposits, um, over here we have superconductors. Um, examples of these are aluminum or um, tungsten silicide and, uh, and many others. Um, we can also look at Dirac materials and, um, and also heavy fermion systems, heavy fermions. Okay. Um, don't be alarmed if you don't know what any of these things mean. It's mainly I want to make sure that if you uh, if you hear about these things that you're uh, that you that, that you've at least understood at least a little bit. Um, um, where they fit in uh, in the big picture, and just to sort of um, complete the picture over here. So with nuclei, there are also different ideas of how we can use um, phonons. So we can think of using color centers for the EV and above range, um, using superfluid helium for milli EVs, um, and also um, polar crystals. So that's um, that's just uh, sort of to give you a broad um, a broad brush of the whole um, host of ideas that have been proposed in the literature. And as I said, this is a very it's a very young field um, and a very active one. Um, and I hope to be able to kind of give you the tools for you to be able to contribute um, for you to be able to contribute here as well. And so what I want to do for um, for the rest of our sort of lesson today is kind of walk us through a few of these um, a few of these examples to give you a little bit of a taste of. Um, what types of materials people have been talking about, what type of methods for detection, what type of processes to sort of open your mind, um, open your mind in this, uh, in this direction. So we're just going to sort of walk through a few of these. Okay, where I've, I've, I've picked out a few that sort of, um, I think, give you a good idea for different philosophies and uh, different processes as well. Um, but before we walk through, uh, walk through a few of these, I just want to... Um, Make a, two side notes or two more um, two more comments of things that that often um, that you might uh, see appearing in this uh, appearing in the literature if you uh, go looking. Um, so the first, okay. So let me. Here's my side note one. Um, is that um, if you remember in our rate, we had a piece. Uh, this is just about two different things that sit um, that sit in the rate. So our rate for for a dark matter interaction, uh, if you remember, was proportional to some cross-section of an interaction between the dark matter and the target. In this case, it's going to be um, electrons. And this is typically written in the literature in the following way. So it's usually written as some reference cross-section. I'll explain in a moment what I mean by that, um, times something that's called a form factor. Okay. Um, so this is just an easy way to be able to compare apples to apples um, between different um, between different materials in different cases. So usually this will be written. You'll see there's some sigma bar e that's saying that it's a, a reference cross section times um, a form factor, which is capital F dark matter squared. Okay, so this um, this form factor over here. Sorry, so let's start actually with this cross section. So this cross section is a cross section. at some fixed momentum transfer. And this is sort of um, conventionally 
chosen to be alpha times me, which is a typical momentum transfer in, uh, in a semiconductor. It's not the typical momentum transfer for all systems, but because that's sort of the first ideas that were put forward were the semiconductor proposals. Um, and so this has sort of been accepted by the community as a good uh, choice for a reference, uh, for a reference momentum. Um, okay, so this is typical for semiconductors. This is typical for semiconductors, not for others. Um, and then the fact that we are using not a real cross-section, but a cross-section at a fixed momenta, what we do is sort of correct for the momentum dependence by using this, uh, this form factor. So that's um, what's sitting over here. We correct for um, momentum dependence in the following way. Um, so remember, again, we had, let's go back to this picture over here where we had dark matter scattering. Okay, and let's say it's scattered through some T-channel. Okay, and here was my target of electrons. Now, remind you that I had over here some energy deposit and some momentum transfer. Then if you think about what the real cross-section would be, I'd have some propagator of, um, propagator of whatever it is that was mediating the interaction between dark matter and the electrons. And um, so this propagator would have, uh, would have a momentum dependence, right? So my propagator, you know, would look um, roughly like one over, I'll have here an M phi squared plus the momentum transfer squared. That's because the energy deposit is typically smaller than the momentum transfer. Um, okay, so this is because in a process like this, the energy deposit is smaller than the momentum transfer. And so um, what this gives you is, um, so you see that what happens is depending on whether the mediator mass M phi is substantially larger or smaller than the cross than the sorry than the momentum transfer. This will give us a different form. So this is typically written in the following way: this um, form factor squared is either one when M phi is much larger than oops than the reference cross than the reference momentum that we're using than alpha M e. This is what we call a heavy mediator. Um, or it looks like alpha M e squared over Q squared for the case when M phi is substantially smaller than that reference momentum, and this is what we call a light mediator. Okay, so this is, um, this is sort of uh, the language that you'll often um, see appearing in the literature. This is what this form factor is. Um, and often when people present results um, for light dark matter direct detection, you'll see results that are um, either for the heavy mediator or for the, or for the light mediator. Okay, um, so that was that's my first uh, first side note about how um, pieces that come into uh, into the rate computation, um, and the second one is um, is the following. So let's move here to side note two. Um, so remember, we also had another piece in our rate that it was proportional to what I call target properties. Okay. Um, now, historically, these um, target properties, and even if I was teaching this course probably uh, six months ago. Um, then uh, the way that I would have be, that I'd be writing out these target properties is by writing out some overlap between, um, let's say, you know, the initial wave function of the electron that's being hit times uh, the overlap with the final state electron wave function. Um, but this uses sort of a single particle um, picture. Um, so that's what's historically been done. So historically, um, this is computed using um, overlap of single particle excitations in the material. Um, but it's actually, we now have, um, we've been able to recently develop a, um, what I think is a much more general and more accurate um, uh, way to think about this, which uh, automatically includes all of the many body effects that sit inside a system. Because you know, materials aren't really just collections of free um, of free particles. They're also um, uh, not just effects that have to do with the fact that they're not free, but also interactions between them that lead to many um, to sort of collective modes um, that can also contribute, in particular, um, plasmonic modes. Um, so, just in general, we have sort of a more general more general method for treating this, um, which you've just been able to uh, to um, to uh, to derive recently, and this is using something that's called the dielectric function or related to it, um, dielectric function um, or related to it, the loss function of the material, which is the imaginary part of minus one over the dielectric function, which is typically called epsilon of this um, Q and uh, 
example, either omega or the deposited energy. Okay, and, and what's important here is not, um, we're not going to go into what is this, there are ways to compute this, but what's really nice is that instead of computing it, which is then relies on which effects you're able or not able to account for, this is really something that is measurable. Okay, and so you can really include automatically um, all of the all of the proper response of the of the material. Um, and so basically, kind of a, the the point that I want you to sort of keep in mind is here's my dark matter that's coming in and scattering. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening inside the material. There's some material response over here. Okay, and this um, this uh, this formalism allows you to sort of automatically uh, automatically incorporate everything that's going on in the material. And so um, you can read about this in a paper that we just put out recently, um, 2101.08263. Um, and so I'm not going to be writing out explicit wave function overlaps in a semiconductor, semiconductor crystal, um, et cetera, which maybe six months ago we would be doing because there's a piece of the story that's, that's really being missed. And um, I think this is a, a more... Um, um, a smarter way to be um, to be approaching the problem. Okay, so this uh, this is something that automatically includes. Um, uh, many body effects. Okay, um, and of course, I will be giving you references um, to where you can uh, where you can see um, all sorts of different uh, different treatments and different materials as we as we walk through a few um, through a different a few different types. Okay, so those were my uh, two side notes on the rate in general in the context of scattering with electrons. And uh, what I want us to do with our uh, remaining time is, as I said, sort of walk through um, a few of these many new, uh, many new proposals for, um, for dark matter detect detectors or materials um, to sort of understand what, uh, what's going on. Okay, so um, let's start with example number one. Um, and these are actually the first ideas that were that were proposed um, in the literature. And these, um, these are that we can either have, let's say dark matter could come in and ionize an atom, ionization, um, or we can have something, um, dark matter coming in and um, exciting an electron from uh, inside a semiconductor from uh, the valence band to the conduction band. Okay, so here's sort of atomic ionization. Here's, you know, here's my atom, Ooh, with my electron over here, and dark matter could come in and ionize it. Um, and the energy in a typical atom for doing this is um, the, uh, the energy is of order 10 EV in order to ionize something. Um, in a semiconductor, so here's sort of, uh, here's the dispersion, energy versus uh, momentum. And so here's a valence band and a conduction band. And I want to be able to promote an electron across the gap. Um, so there's a minimal energy for this. The energy has to be above, usually it's of order EV or a few EV in typical semiconductors. Okay. And so based on, um, based on uh, our energy guideline from before, this tells me that I can be sensitive to dark matter masses of order MeV or 10 MeV uh, and above, okay? And uh, for, this, uh, for the case of a semiconductor, definitely there's been um, a lot of work. As I said, this, these ideas are uh, uh, roughly a decade, um, a decade old. So these were first proposed in um, a paper by, um, uh, by Essig et al. in 2012. And if you want to read about how to write down the wave functions, the single particle state wave functions um, in semiconductors, and there's a really great um, paper, again, by Essig and Company, 1509.01598, that gives a lot of details of how to do um, those types of computations. Um, and there are a couple of experiments that are uh, sort of uh, moving forward with, um, with trying to uh, uh, trying to construct these types of uh, these types of experiments, and so, um, for instance, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, semiconductors, and there are two of them. Um, well, I mean, there are a few, but uh, I'm not going to actually be talking about Sensei. That's one that's um, was really didn't exist before and is really being designed in this context. Um, I just want to sort of give you the idea of what Super CDMS is doing. Okay, um, so for instance, Super CDMS they have some puck of silicon. Okay, I'm sure it doesn't really look like this, but um, you know, imagine that this is some silicon puck. Okay, and then um, hopefully dark matter is going to come in and scatter with this. Okay, so here's whoop, dark matter coming in. Um, it's going to deposit enough energy to excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. Um, and then basically they're sort of, uh, they're applying an electric field and they're getting a whole bunch of photons. But the idea is basically that they're letting their excitations kind of ricochet around in here. Okay, whoop, ricochet all over until eventually they hit some collection fins that are sitting on the surface. 
Um, and then they have a very small um, sensitive sensor that are called transition end sensors, um, which are uh, uh, which are sort of superconductors that. Um, so let me just let me just explain what these are. So that, that then can detect that these excitations um, happen. Okay, so you let everything sort of bounce around, random walk around until you collect and detect. Um, so this is a uh, actually let me just let me just give a name to sort of this philosophy. Um, this philosophy is a um, collect, um, uh, collect and detect philosophy, or excitation. Maybe I'll call it excitation concentration. That's better. Let's call this excitation concentration philosophy. OK? Um, and so the technology of choice over here um, in the context of super CDMS are these transition edge sensors, okay, or in short, they're called TESs. Um, they're also used a lot in, um, um, in all sorts of uh, Astro and Cosmo um, uh, uh, experiments. Um, but just the basic idea is very simple. So it's, um, it's the following. So I have some superconductor, okay, that's sitting, um, so a superconductor that's sitting in some self-biased circuit so I'm sitting exactly as kind of at this transition between the normal and meta, between the normal and superconducting state, and what this means is that if I have very small um, changes in uh, in the temperature, very small changes in the energy that's sitting there, then I can get wildly different um, responses of the system. Right? I change the resistivity substantially, and so this um, this can lead to so if something comes in and sort of moves me from my um, from my superconducting to my normal state. Then, um, then it can very, very quickly be able to, um, uh, this leads to a huge voltage pulse that we can, a uh, huge change in the current or a huge change in the voltage pulse, which we can then um, read out. Okay, so this is, this is sort of, um, this is a type of superconducting, uh, this is a superconductor sensor that can be sensitive to very, very small um, energy deposits. Okay, and you know, I'd say that the kind of a decade after these, um, after the, this idea was first, um, first Put forward, we now have um, we now have experiments that are really um, bringing it um, bringing it to life. So um, that's what I wanted to tell you about uh, semiconductors and this uh, atomic ionization. But if we sort of go back to this um, to these energy thresholds we were talking about, that we see that we fundamentally can't go to lower masses through electronic excitations in these systems, right? That's just because we need EVs of deposit, and our energy guy then tells us that then we're stuck with MeV and above masses. I mean, we're not stuck. That's great. But what happens if we want to go lower? So um, what happens if we want to go even lower masses, okay, so to masses that are beneath an MeV? Um, so that's going to lead me to my second, uh, the second example, which are using superconductors as the target, okay? So the second example um, are superconductors. And um, the thing about superconductors is uh, really kind of all you need to know is that the ground state is it's no longer free electrons, but um, it's energetically favorable for these electrons to follow a buddy system. So they pair up in pairs that are called Cooper pairs. Okay, so the bounce, the ground state are these pairs that are called Cooper pairs. And um, the gap of the system or the binding energy is of order milli EV. And so based on our energy guideline, um, this could give a sensitivity to KV dark matter masses, okay? So the idea would be that dark matter would come in, it would deposit enough energy to break these Cooper pairs apart, and that's going to lead to some excitations in the system that we're somehow going to detect, okay? So dark matter is going to come in, deposit enough energy to break the Cooper pairs apart, and uh, we're going we're gonna to detect this. Um, and there are two different um, notions of how you can do this. One way would be to do something very similar to what Super CDMS is doing for the semiconductors, but now replace that silicon puck with a, a bulk superconductor. Um, but what I want to tell you about, because I want to sort of give you ideas for different types of detection philosophies and also different technologies in case, um, in case you, um, you have, this, uh, you have these, uh, these types of ideas um, yourself. Um, so the, the the philosophy that um, that I'll tell you about now is to use something that I'll call the target plus sensor philosophy. Okay, where um, this is something that we put forward um, in uh, in a PRL paper recently. So this is um, this is something uh, from 1903.05101. Um, and so. Um, 
So here's the technology. So the idea behind target and sensor is that I'll use the same thing to be the target with which dark matter is interacting and simultaneously the sensitive sensor that's noticing that something happened. Okay, so it's the same device is gonna be both the target and the sensor. It won't be that I have one material that's the target and something else is slapped on to be the sensor, okay? Um, and so uh, an example of a technology that you could use for this are what are called superconducting nanowire. It's a very long name. Single photon, oops, capital. Single photon detector. Or in short, these things are called SNSPDs. Um, so this is the type of technology um, that we can use. And, and importantly, this is actually a very mature technology um, that's been developed for quantum information science. So for quantum sensing, okay? Um, and so the idea is that, you know, so here's what a nanowire typically looks like. Okay, obviously I'm not gonna be doing it justice, but you see it's like very, very little snaky little thing like that that's going back and forth and the sort of the thickness of this of this curve is is like a, the nanometer um, they're typically kind of small but um, the one that we actually um, that we actually have as a prototype is of order 400 let's say microns squared okay so um, so these things are gradually being uh, built up a larger and larger size but the idea is that you know I have some little nano wire like this and it's sitting in some circuit that's again close to some uh, close to some um, uh, some critical value of some current and the idea would be the dark matter is going to come in Okay, it deposits enough energy. It breaks these Cooper pairs apart. It's depositing energy and now that's going to create some hot spot Okay, so I'm going to have some hot spot developing in this nanowire that causes my electrons to diffuse away and that's sourcing a resistive region Across the nanowire Okay, and that's gonna lead to some voltage pulse. Okay, so there's gonna be some whoop, voltage pulse that we're gonna be able to uh, be able to detect, okay? Um, and so um, using this as an example of this target plus, uh, plus sensor philosophy, um, you, can, you can think of being sensitive to dark matter masses all the way down to, in principle, the KV scale. Um, and in fact, um, recently, it's been shown that these types of devices can have a threshold that's even, uh, so the, the latest one um, that's been demonstrated is uh, a 10 micron wavelength, which means 125 milli EVs. Okay, so this is, this is um, a result that was recently, uh, recently demonstrated um, in terms of uh, the current one that's been used for, um, for dark matter detection in this uh, 1903 paper. Um, this is super tiny. This is just 4.3 nanograms of material, and uh, we know that it had a 0.8 eV threshold. So not yet at the at the milli eV scale where we'd want to go, but we're nowhere near the fundamental limits for this technology. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully, as uh, as technology continues to improve, um, this technology can be put towards um, the dark matter hunt, and and really has a lot of potential to um, to make some uh, impressive grounds. So I've given you. Yeah. You need a curiosity. All these experiments essentially are detecting the mass of the dark matter, but do, is there any information about the direction or anything like that? I mean, typically in these experiments, not in, for dark matter, but for particles or standard matter particles, you have more observables, not only energy observables, even directions or type of CP nature. Right. So that's a great question. That's going to lead me to my, my third example, which is directional information. So, so let me let me get that perfect uh, perfect segue, almost as if it was planned, which of course it wasn't. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so what I was going to say is exactly that that we so so far I've given you, and again there are many different examples, but I've given you sort of two um, two categories, two or three uh, categories, um, for different philosophies, different technologies, different materials. Um, neither none of what I've said so far gives you directional information. So that's um, that's the third example that I wanna um, that I wanna go through quickly. Um, so my third, uh, my third example is how can we hope to get directional um, information, okay, or directional detection, directional detection, okay. Um, so, so can we hope to do this? Um, and now just, just to clarify, what's the importance of this in dark matter um, detection? That's because, you know, if we have some directional information, what we call sort of daily modulation, 
um, that's long been recognized as a powerful tool when we search for dark matter because it separates our signal, a dark matter signal, from backgrounds. Okay, so um, just, just to write this out. So, um, um, so directional detection, directional detection has long been recognized as a powerful tool for dark matter detection because it leads to a daily modulation rate. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and it gives us a way to separate our dark matter signal from backgrounds. Okay, so just to sort of um, draw you a picture of what I mean by this. Okay, so here's, whoop, here's us on planet Earth. Okay, and let's say this is um, planet Earth's axis and we're gonna be rotating around this axis, of course, on a daily basis. And let's say here's my experiment, okay, and I have some ability, I don't know, to detect, to, 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 um, to detect some direction, okay, I have some experiment that's sitting, and I've drawn to you, you know, where my experiment sits at a certain point in the day versus 12 hours later when uh, Earth is rotated around its axis, and, you know, we're facing some, uh, there's some direction here of the dark matter wind, okay, and so you see that if I have an ability to know where in my experiment, which direction is my signal coming from, then I have the ability to say, ah, this is dark matter versus you know some other um, some other signal that, that shouldn't be coming from this uh, from the same direction of the dark matter wind. Okay, and in all of the stories that I've in all of the examples that I've told you so far, you know what we're detecting. There, there's no directional information. Okay, um, if we're detecting secondary excitations, certainly for letting them ricochet around, we're not going to detect. You know, we're not going to get directional information. Um, in the nanowire story that I that I that, that we just discussed, there's also no directional information. So how can we hope to retain um, directional information? And, and there are several ways to do this. I just want to tell you um, again, just give you sort of one example. Um, so one thing that we could do is use um, what I'm going to call an eject and detect philosophy. Okay, um, and this is something that we can hope to do with um, with 2D targets. So um, you know, imagine that I have some. Okay, um, so let's say I have graphene, okay, some sheet of graphene, and let's say the dark matter comes in, okay, and deposits enough energy to eject an electron from the material, okay, Whoop, here's my electron, it's been ejected from this material. Now, if I observe this primary particle and not some excitations, and I can have hope of understanding what direction the initial particle came from, um, and, and, and in this case, actually, um, this is exa exactly what, um, what we can do, because if I look at, for instance, graphene, Okay, so maybe I'll just say one more thing here is that the energy to eject an electron from, not just from graphene, but actually from uh, most materials, you have to overcome what's called the work function. This is typically of order a few EB. Okay, so this will give you sensitivity based on our energy guideline to MeV scale uh, masses. But importantly, we have a chance of actually having directional information. Okay, so uh, what do I mean by this? So think of this picture that I just, um, that I just drew here. So let's say dark matter comes in. It deposits enough energy to eject an electron from the material. Now it turns out that in graphene, the direction of that ejected electron tracks the direction of the incoming particle. Okay, it didn't have to be that way, but it happens to be that way in certain uh, in certain materials. So um, the ejected electron tracks the direction of the dark matter particle that hit it. Okay. And so in the setup that I've uh, described to you here, we basically automatically have um, either daily modulation or even simpler, we have some forward-backward discrimination power, okay? So imagine here's my graphene sub, here's my graphene, okay, and it's sitting on, you know, on some other substrate. And let's say at a certain point during the day, here's my dark matter wind that's coming in, when whoop, an electron is ejected out and I detect it. And now fast forward to 12 hours later, now, Earth is rotated around its axis, and now, if I think of this, um, of here's my graphene sitting on some substrate, now the relative direction is reversed. The dark matter wind is coming in from on top, and my ejected, my ejected electron is, uh, you know, being sort of ejected into my substrate, okay? So I either don't detect it or I detect it as something different. So this, um, this, type, of, uh, this type of setup automatically gives us forward-backward asymmetry, okay? And so this is capable of giving us directional information about um, about the dark matter um, about the dark matter direction. And this is just one uh, one of a couple of examples. You can also think of using 
and these atropies that um, appear inside inside your material and, and things like that. But it's definitely not an easy thing to be able to come up with a directional detection idea. And if you do ever come up with a directional detection idea, then basically you're golden because you know, if you were to ever see a signal, it would be so important to be able to establish that this isn't a, a background that you don't understand, but rather there is actually, um, this is actually a dark matter, um, a dark matter signal. And so um, this actually idea to use uh, graphene has now been officially adopted by the Ptolemy experiment, which is planted um, in Gran Sasso. Okay, so these ideas are not, uh, not science fiction, and you can find this um, in a paper that we first proposed, 1606.0884849, if you uh, want to read a little bit more about, um, about this idea. Okay, so um, until now, I've given you uh, hopefully a little bit of a taste of these different materials, different detection philosophies, some different technologies um, that get used including ways that we could hope to have a directional detection. Um, and uh, so, you know, basically, if we think about at the beginning of the lesson, I showed you um, a plot that you typically see from direct detection experiments that shows you the existing constraints on, um, on sort of the, the cross section with nuclei as a function of dark matter mass. And we can sort of draw an equivalent now looking at um, going to lighter masses and talking about what happens with the interactions with electrons. And so here's sort of, again, a typical plot that one can see often in, um, in uh, papers that, uh, that describes this. So now it's going to show you the size of some, the, that sigma bar, the reference cross section with electrons as a function of the dark matter mass. Um, and what, what, what kind of typically happens is that there are, there's sort of a bunch of different, you know, there'll be a bunch of different curves that are giving you the different reach for different materials that all have, let's say, order EV energy sensitivity, and those are going to drop off at MEV energies, MEV masses, excuse me. Um, and then there are a select few that manage to go, you know, sort of, let's say, superconductors, for instance, that manage to go all the way down to the KV um, mass scale because they have sensitivity to those milliEV um, band gaps. Okay, um, and the constraints on this parameter space, because this is such a, such a conceptually a young field, existing constraints on this parameter space are um, are very uh, are currently very weak. I mean, it's very impressive that we already have bounds, but they sort of typically sit all the way up here. And to give you some numbers, um, so for instance, uh, sort of existing constraints um, typically sit here at let's say ten to the minus thirty five, and this is all in units of centimeter squared. Um, often these uh, EV EV systems, um, let's say they reach down to 10 to the minus 40, um, and many of these uh, milli-EV uh, node chains can be sensitive, for instance, to 10 to the minus 42 centimeter squared per gram. Okay, and the numbers that I'm giving you here are for the light mediator case, for the heavy mediator case, um, they scale a little differently, but it's um, sort of conceptually, conceptually the same. Okay, so we, there are lots of new ways that we could be hoping to probe this uh, totally un, untouched parameter space where you see Here's where we're kind of managing, uh, managing to probe right now, and hopefully we'll be able to whoop, swoop down and really make a lot of progress, maybe even hopefully detect dark matter if it's sitting um, well, anywhere that we've thought of an experiment that could, um, that could be sensitive to it. Unit, before you go, mm -hmm. there's a question. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the idea of the direction, the direction detection, Mm -hmm. uh, would this be also works for relativistic dark matter produced, for instance, in cosmic ray uh, showers? Yeah, so you can, um, yeah, absolutely, you can you can think of this not just for sort of the relic dark matter that's here, but also for boosted dark matter that's coming in. You know, what would change in your computation would be um, the velocity dispersion, essentially. Um, uh, and, you know, based on that sort of sensitivity to what um, to what masses and at what, at what strength. But um, for the directional detection over here, um, there's not much in the kinematics that really that requires it to be, you know, with a with a slow with a slow velocity versus a fast velocity. Sometimes, uh, when you think of a particular material, because electrons in a material have typical uh, typical velocities, so they have Fermi velocities, and those, let's say, in a metal are ten to the minus two, and graphene is ten to the minus three, and some other materials it could be ten to the minus four. And sometimes there might be kinematical conditions that will either suppress or enhance your rate based on. What's the what's the velocity of your dark matter versus the, the typical velocity in the target, um, but not for the case of this eject and detect um, eject and detect philosophy. I don't think you get any kinematical um, suppression um, from sort of the kinematics sitting there, and then you just have to fold in what is what is the right flux of dark matter that you're um, that you're being sensitive to. Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, great. So then just, uh, uh, I know we're writing a, a tight schedule today. So um, just one more point um, before we finish, uh, before we finish for today and, and finish these lectures. Um, I just want to point out to you that anytime somebody tells you about a dark matter detector, um, you can always actually go even further. So any target material. can go um, further than just uh, what we've been discussing, you can really get two for the price of one. And I'll explain what I mean. Okay, so this is, um, this is something very important to always keep in mind. Um, what I mean is that until now we were talking about dark matter scattering, right? We had dark matter that came in, there's my dark matter. Okay, scattered, came out, um, you know, here's my target, okay? Um, but in general, uh, there's another process that could um, that could happen, which would be dark matter absorption. So this is scattering, but I could also have dark matter being absorbed in the material. And what I mean by that is that dark matter comes in, and no dark matter comes out. Okay, you know, here's my target, and maybe maybe electrons are shooting out, or photons, or phonons, or some excitations, but not dark matter. Okay, so if dark matter gets absorbed in the material. Then, if we think of that energy guideline, um, in this case, the energy deposited is the entire dark matter mass. It's not just the kinetic energy, it's the entire mass energy of the particle. And so thinking back to this energy guideline that we, um, that we drew before, where here's my energy deposit, and we looked at what was the mass of dark matter that I was sensitive to through a scattering process, right? And there we had that if we had KV, we matched onto GV, and if we were at EV, we matched onto um, to MEV, right? There was always six orders of magnitude difference between the energy deposit and the mass that we were sensitive to. But now, if we also consider absorption processes, then KV systems are sensitive to KV masses. And EV energy deposits are sensitive to EV masses, likewise milliEV to milliEV. Okay, so you naturally get two mass ranges for the price of one in any target material that you're talking about. Okay, so that's, um, and so similarly to these scattering plots, one will often see um, absorption plots, um, reach and, uh, and constraints on dark matter that's being absorbed in, uh, in a target. So um, just to sort of bring everything together um, and just to summarize, obviously I'm not really gonna summarize um, these hours that we've been spending together, but I hope that I've convinced you that dark matter, um, dark matter research is, um, is exciting. Um, we've talked a lot about different mechanisms, um, different models, and different ways to detect. And um, I hope I've given you at least, um, you know, a little bit of an idea about how, um, how to think about these problems, how to develop some intuition, how to quickly be able to get back of the envelope estimates to see whether something's going to work or not. Um, and also sort of um, uh, giving you, I hope, a little bit of the tools to keep an open mind um, so that hopefully you will one day um, soon be able to, you know, maybe your next model is going to be the, the new amazing uh, mechanism for dark matter with some new, uh, new impressive model for how, um, uh, for how it, it really gets realized in particle theories. And, and maybe even you'll come up with the next best um, idea for how to detect dark matter in some way that nobody previously thought possible. Um, and hopefully I've given you a little bit of a sense if with thinking um, in new ways about, um, about this old puzzle. I think that um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of exciting stuff lies ahead, and I hope to, hope to be reading your papers on, uh, on the topic. So thanks so much, everyone. And that's it for me. Thanks, uh, thanks to you, Yonit, for these great lectures. Uh, we don't have time for more questions, but I guess if there are some late questions, uh, they can, the students can, can, can write to you. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks, Aveli, again. Thanks to everybody for the attendance. And let's uh, close here not only the last lecture, but also the school. And I'm sending to everybody the link to the visit of the Dharmata Laboratory. So please connect to the visit. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, Yanis, again. Thanks so Goodbye, much, everybody. everybody.